At this point, we want to shift gears. Now, up till now, we've worked with the derivative. It's mostly consisted of given a function, how do we find its derivative, and then where are the main applications of the derivative. We want to turn the problem on its head. So the idea is going to be, somebody hands me a derivative, how do I find the function that it came from? Now, as an example, suppose somebody gives us 2x, how do we find the function that has its derivative 2x? Well, we've worked with this one enough that we can readily identify that as the derivative of x squared. Now, note, okay, there's a little glitch here. Okay, it's also going to be the derivative of x squared plus 3. Okay, if we take the derivative of 3, that goes to 0. x squared plus 10, x squared plus 100, x squared plus a million. So, when we go looking for solutions to our problem, we're not going to get just one function. We're going to get a whole bunch of them. So, in this case, our solution would be, okay, at least we would have x squared, and then we can add any real number to it that we like and then that's going to give us a solution. Now, let's think about how we get to our answer. So let's suppose we're given the function x squared plus x plus 1. So if that's the derivative, okay, what kind of operations are we going to have to perform to figure out where it came from? Well, one thing you could ask is, how would I get down to an x squared if I took a derivative? Well, if I take the derivative of x cubed, we're going to get 3x squared. So that's one way to get your x squared back. Then the other problem is going to be, what about the 3? So if I was to use 1 third x cubed, when I take its derivative, what happens? We're going to get 3x squared, but we're going to multiply that by 1 third, and then that'll cancel out to leave me with the x squared. So if you notice, the rule here is going to be, for x squared, I want to start with an x cubed, but to make sure I don't get stuck with that 3, I'm going to divide by 3. So it's going to be our rule. It's going to be add 1 to your exponent, flip it over. So for instance, if we take the x, okay, that's going to be x to the 1. If I add 1, we're going to have x squared, and if I flip that over, I get a 1 half. Okay, if you take the derivative of this, what are you going to get? The 2 comes down, cancels with the 1 half, then we'll be left with an x. Then for the 1, we can think of that as being x to the 0. So if I add 1 and flip it over, we would have x to the first power, which is just x. Flip over the 1, we get a 1 over 1. So we're just going to get an x. So if we take the derivative of x, we're going to get a 1. Now, note that's to check in our work. Okay, The idea is going to be, once you think you have the function that gives you your derivative, you just take its derivative to check. So here we get 3 comes down, subtract 1. 2 comes down, subtract 1, the x goes to a 1, and then this constant c is going to go to 0. So that's going to be your check for your work. Okay, so our rule is going to be, if we had x to the n, n not equal to minus 1, you add 1 to your exponent, flip it over. Okay, now the question is, what happens with n equal to minus 1? And that's a long story that we get back to later on. Now, let's work in some notation and definitions. First, the process that we're trying to perform here we call anti-differentiation or integration. So, somebody's going to hand us a derivative. We want to know what function it comes from. So the idea is we're trying to undo the process of differentiation. So anti-differentiation. Now, for the notation, if we're given a derivative as little f, we have the function capital F has its derivative little f. We'll call capital F an antiderivative of little f. If that capital F isn't available, but we still want to refer to the process, we're going to have the indefinite integral of f of x with respect to x. So the parts here are going to be, okay, we have our integration sign. We have our integrand f of x. So that's the thing we're treating as a derivative. And then we have dx. So dx refers to the variable that we're integrating with respect to. So later on, we'll see that we can change that if we need to. Now, you'll also note when we write this out, we're going to add on a constant on the end. So it's going to be called a constant of integration. Put that there because if we have any antiderivative, say capital F, 
If I add a constant to it, say, take capital F plus three, if we take the derivative, we're just gonna get back little f. So you can add any number that you want to an antiderivative, you get another antiderivative. Okay, so for example, if we take indefinite integral of 2x with respect to x, then note, okay, well, what function has as its derivative 2x? Well, we know one, that's gonna be x squared. So our answer is gonna be x squared plus a constant. But someone else could come back at us with, well, how about x squared plus one, x squared plus 10? They're all perfectly good answers too. So this constant here is gonna catch all of those extra answers. So let's take a look at an indefinite integral in practice. We're gonna have the indefinite integral of x to the fourth plus x with respect to x. Now, the rule that I'm using, if we have x to a power, what we'll do is we'll add one to the exponent, flip it over. So for x to the fourth, we're gonna add one, I'll get x to the fifth, we flip over, I get a one fifth. For x, that's x to the one, we add one, I get x squared, flip it over, I get a one half. So we're gonna have one fifth x to the fifth plus one half x squared plus c, our constant of integration. Now, you don't wanna forget this, that'll usually cost you a point or two in your homework or on an exam. We're not done yet, we still wanna check our work. So you should always do this if there's time. Now note, what we've done here, we can rewrite as, okay, capital F prime equals little f. So that's just saying if you take the derivative of this, we better get back our integrand, our little f. So let's check that. So if we take the derivative of this here, okay, we could do it term by term. So the idea is pull the one fifth out, derivative of x to the fifth is five x to the fourth power. Then the next term, bring out the one half, derivative of x squared is two x. Then the derivative of our constant is just gonna be zero. So we see at the end of the day, we're gonna get back our x to the fourth plus x. That's our little f, our integrand. So our work checks out. As a final note, let's consider the solution to our indefinite integral. So that's capital F plus C. That's gonna suggest that if I wanna find all antiderivatives of the function little f, we just find one antiderivative, so it'll be capital F. Then we can get all others by just adding a constant. Let's see that that's true. So we're gonna be working over an interval CD. Usually that's just gonna be all real numbers. Then our theorem says if we have two antiderivatives for the function little f, call them capital F, capital G, then we're gonna have to have the capital F equals capital G plus C. All right, so for our proof, we're gonna need the mean value theorem. So you may wanna go review that. Now, by definition of antiderivative, okay, the derivative of capital F is little f, derivative of capital G is little f. If I define another function, capital H, it's capital F minus capital G, I take the derivative of capital H, we're gonna get zero, because that's gonna be equal to little f minus little f. Now, let's bring in the mean value theorem. So we're gonna have two points in our interval, a and b, say a less than b. I'm gonna form this expression, capital H of b minus capital H of a over b minus a. So if we take a and b, take the values for h, what we're doing here is taking the secant line through the two points on the graph at a and b. Mean value theorem says, somewhere in the interval between a and b, we're gonna have an x such that the slope of the secant line is equal to the derivative of h at our point x. Now, we know that that derivative is gonna be equal to zero everywhere. So it doesn't matter what b or a we choose, we're always gonna get a zero here. Now, that's gonna mean, okay, we could clear out the b minus a. We're always gonna have h of a equals h of b. There's nothing special about a or b here. Once we fix, say, h of a equal to c, then for all points in our interval cd, we're gonna to have to have that h of x is equal to c. That means, okay, h is equal to f minus g, so we're gonna to have to have capital F minus capital G is equal to C, and that gives us our result. Now, 
How will this theorem make your life difficult? So you work out an indefinite integral. You check your answer by taking the derivative so you know you have the right answer. Then you go to the back of the book, look up the answer there, and it doesn't look like the answer that you found. So in this case, your answer is going to differ from the one in the book by just adding a constant. And then it's not always going to be clear how you get from one answer to the other. So we'll see this over and over again. Now, for a basic example of this, let's take a look at the indefinite integral of 2x plus 2 with respect to x. Now, if we use our exponent rule, so we're going to have x to a power, so I'll add 1 to the exponent, flip it over. Here we have an x to the 1, so if I add 1, I'll get x squared, and then flipping it over gives me a 1 half, and then we have a 2 on the outside. For the 2, okay, you can think of that as 2 times 1. 1 is equal to x to the 0 power. So if I add 1, flip it over, we're just going to have x divided by 1. Okay, and in general, you should just think of the rule. If you take the integral of a constant, that's just going to give you your constant times x. So we're going to wind up getting x squared plus 2x, and then plus our constant of integration. Now, another approach okay, is to sit down, think of things that have that as its derivative. So if you take x plus 1 squared, take its derivative, you have the chain rule. So you give me 2 times x plus 1, drop the exponent by 1, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 1. So what comes out is going to be 2x plus 2. So we know x squared plus 2x is an antiderivative. x plus 1 quantity squared is also an antiderivative. Now, how do I get from one to the other? Well, if we expand this, we're going to get x squared plus 2x plus 1. So you'll note capital F, capital G are not equal, but they differ by the constant 1. If we take the derivatives of both, we note what comes out is going to be 2x plus 2 for both. So these are definitely both antiderivatives.